I think it's important for you to remember that your own experience, your own subjective internal feelings matter a whole lot. And that's something that's often ignored. Uh, you know, it's not just how much it's impacting your life, but also how much it sucks for you. You know, if you're really not feeling good, that matters. Hey, everybody. Before we start the show, I want to make a couple disclaimers. This show does cover a wide variety of topics related to mental health and life in general, and some of those could be sensitive for you. I want to simultaneously encourage you to be brave in consuming difficult content, but also respect and recognize your limitations. So please use your best judgment. I will never be offended if you need to skip a question or an episode entirely, but feel free to feel it out, check out the episode, and just see what happens. If you need to skip, that's okay, but you know, feel free to give it a shot first. I also need to say that while I am a psychologist, I'm not your psychologist, and I'm not your therapist. This is not intended to be direct medical advice, and you should not use this as a substitute for professional help. So with those said, let's go ahead and get into the show. All right. Hello, friends of all varieties. This is the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast, episode 300. Holy shit. 300. That's a lot of episodes. <laughs> I'm your host, Dr. Robert Duff, aka Duff the Psych. I make mental health content for real people just like you. And uh, today I have a normal question and answer episode. I had thrown out the idea of doing some uh, kind of feedback from people about questions they had asked on the show previously, but as usual, I waited way too long to do that and didn't plan well enough for episode 300, so we're just doing a normal episode. Why the hell not? Um, I did want to take a moment, though, to just like reflect and say thank you, guys. From the bottom of my heart, thank you for listening to the show. Um, I know there are a good handful of you who have been around since episode one, which was in March 2016. 2016, guys. I can't believe I've been doing the show for that long. <laughs> like, I feel like I'm still getting the hang of it. Um, but no, it's been a very long time. You know, we're up to 300 episodes now. We're up to, what, 850 ratings on iTunes um, or Apple Podcasts, whatever. Uh, this show has been through a lot of different stages and phases in my life. And uh, for you guys, too, if you've been listening for a long time. So I just really appreciate your attention. I appreciate your trust in me to take your questions and do my best with them. Um, I hope that this is always valuable to you, even if the question doesn't directly apply to your situation. You know, I hope that you always get something out of listening to these episodes. And I always appreciate you, you know, being interested in in me as an individual and as a person as well. You know, I'm a psychologist, I'm a therapist, I do a lot of things under that umbrella. Um, but I'm also a dude. <laughs> and it's nice to have, uh, you know, you guys to be along for the ride as I do my best to help you guys out. So 300 episodes. Um, I'm not planning on quitting anytime soon. This is a, a cornerstone of sort of my life and my career right now. Um, and I'm not planning on stopping anytime soon. There may be changes to the format or whatever in the future, but right now we're just chugging along. So, you know, here's to the next 300 episodes. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and get into the questions for today. I have two really good questions, just like always. If you want to send me a question for the show, shoot me an email. Uh, DuffThePsych at gmail.com is where you can reach me, uh, which reminds me, <laughs> for the first episode, I definitely um, had to pull questions from like the internet. I pulled questions from Reddit. I pulled questions that I found that were not directed toward me like on Twitter because I had to sort of um, first start by just pulling in questions that I could answer rather than questions that were asked of me because I didn't have this sort of audience yet. And it's just amazing to me that like now I can reliably count on there being a bunch of questions that roll in each week and I never run out of questions to pull from and there's just so much out there so many brave questions so many interesting questions uh, so it's really humbling uh, I'm gonna stop thanking you so much now I'm gonna need to get on with the show <laughs> as I said duffthepsych at gmail.com you could shoot me a question um, you can also just go to my website, duffthepsych.com, browse around, see if your question has been asked before using the search bar. You could use the contact form there on there on the website to contact me and uh, write a question in as well. It goes to the same place. Um, but why don't we go ahead and get started with these questions? Here is the first one. Okay, so first question reads, hey Duff, I'm an 18-year-old male and I have no idea what's going on with me. I always have this sinking feeling in my stomach. I can't sleep and I always feel so alone, even with people that I love. 
I want to ask for help, but I have no idea what to say when they ask what's wrong with me. Thank you for the podcast. It really has helped me understand a lot. Okay. Hey, man. Thank you for writing in. Um, I appreciate the question. I'm particularly proud of you as you know, an 18-year-old man writing into the show and trying to pay some attention to these issues. It's the unfortunate reality um, that there continues to be a lot of stigma when it comes to mental health issues among men. And the fact that you said you want to ask for help is awesome. You know, you're open to getting help, and that already puts you in a much different category than many men that are out there. I think there's a good chance you can make some serious progress here and pull out of these gross feelings that you have. And I think it's important just kind of also on the societal level, like for guys to know that it's okay to approach these issues. It's okay to get help. It's okay to confront difficult things. It doesn't make you weak. In fact, it makes you quite strong. I think it's badass for you to uh, approach things that are scary, right? That's bravery. So um, thank you for the question. Let's talk about some possibilities about what could be going on here. Um, at 18, you are likely in a pretty interesting phase of your life. And I'm not sure exactly what you're up to in your particular life, you know, whether you're a student, whether you're in the workforce, whether you're, you know, taking some time to figure things out, some combination thereof. Um, but for many people, this is a period of life where you're starting to have more responsibilities and more independence and life starts to become more real, you know, whether you're kind of transitioning out of school or into the workforce, whatever it is, there's um, often this looming reality of the real world. Uh, you might still be on, you know, parents' insurance or something like that. You might have some bills that are paid for for you, but things start to kind of become a bit more serious, and that's not always easy. So I think it could be the case that you are running into some emotional difficulties just as the result of these transitional aspects of your life, uh, figuring out what you want to do for your work, applying to places, considering, you know, a relationship, moving out on your own, or, you know, taking steps toward any of these things. Again, I don't know what you're doing with your life. So these are broad sweeping statements, but there are plenty of common reasons to be feeling a lot of feelings when you're at this age. Not to mention the fact that, um, you know, at 18, your brain is technically still in development. You know, you're still going through um, various forms of de development, but particularly in your brain, the the part of it that you know, has to do with really complicated thinking and reasoning and putting things together, organization, cause and effect, that being the frontal lobe of your brain, that's still not going to finish fully solidifying for a few years. So, uh, you know, it's it's an uphill battle to do things that require a lot of reasoning and uh, complex thinking when that part of your brain is still, you know, developing, but the world expects you to sometimes. So you got to make it work one way or another. Um, so yeah, I, I think that, um, there could be a lot of things here. Um, there could be many identifiable stressors, things that are contributing to your current situation, but that doesn't make what you're feeling any less legitimate just because there might be a good explanation for it. Even in our diagnostic manuals. So for instance, the DSM, there's something that we call adjustment disorder, which basically recognizes that somebody can definitely have clinically significant mental health symptoms, you know, at a level that we would consider a disorder. Um, but it's not due to some chronic condition like recurrent major depression or bipolar disorder or something like that. Instead, it's because of the circumstances of their life. So this happens often during these transitional periods, going off to college, switching careers, uh, moving to another state or another country, things like that, where you're going through a life transition and you're having a hard time adjusting to it. Therefore, adjustment disorder. So, you know, I don't want to overinterpret here, um, just throwing out some stuff, right? Um, based on what you mentioned in the question, you talk about this sinking feeling in your stomach. That is a common sensation with many people uh, that have anxiety, that sort of feeling of the, the bottom dropping out. I, I associate that with uh, any times I've gotten really bad news or it's clear that I didn't get an opportunity or I'm in really big trouble because of something that I did. You know, any of those sorts of feelings where it's like, oh, that that sense of, ugh. I'm making a lot of hand gestures. It's, it's almost hard to describe, but yeah, sinking feeling. That's very common. And uh, people with anxiety will often talk about this feeling of impending doom. Like there's something ominous there. It's like, it's just on the edge of your awareness and you can't quite put your finger on it, but it's there and it's making you feel bad. Um, so that could be an element of anxiety that we're talking about. Uh, you also talked about sleep disruption, loneliness. Uh, I'm assuming persistent feelings of like sadness or emptiness. And those sound a lot like what you see in depression. Uh, nothing you're describing here is like completely off the wall. Nothing here is 
unusual for people that are struggling. Um, and I think it's also plenty for you to be concerned about. Hey friends, the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast will be right back after this short message from our sponsor. All right, this episode is brought to you by Policy Genius. I mean, does anybody really like insurance? I mean, like I like having it, obviously. I benefit from having insurance of a variety of types. But does anybody really enjoy like the process of finding insurance and interfacing with insurance companies? I, probably not too many people. Um, in particular, you know, I've had some some issues figuring out and navigating the whole life insurance space. But life insurance is pretty important, especially if there's anybody that relies on you for financial support, whether that's child or aging parent, um, business partner. You know, life insurance is very important. It gives you the peace of mind that if something were to happen to you, your loved ones would have some degree of financial cushion. And, uh, you know, if you have a job that provides life insurance, it may not be enough. Most people need up to 10 times more coverage to properly provide for their families. And it gets more expensive as you age. So it's smart to get a policy sooner rather than later. But as I said, it's a very confusing landscape. And that's where Policy Genius comes in. Policy Genius is your one stop shop to find insurance you need at the right price, not just life insurance, all sorts of different types. They are not an insurance company, they are a marketplace for insurance providers. So what you do is you go to the link in my description at the show notes, or you go to policygenius.com and you just answer a few questions. And within minutes, they compare personalized quotes from top companies to find your lowest price. You could save up to 50% or more on life insurance by comparing quotes with Policy Genius. Um, they have a team of experts who are licensed at Policy Genius, and they're on hand throughout the entire process to help you understand your options and make decisions with confidence. Their team works for you, not for the insurance companies. So whether you're just starting to shop or you have questions about a policy that you already have, they're independent advocates that can offer unbiased advice, which is extremely valuable. They don't add on any extra fees and they don't sell your info to third parties so you can rest assured that uh, it's a good service and you can check out the thousands of five-star reviews across Google, Trustpilot, other websites like that. They have options that offer coverage in as little as a week so you don't have to go through the whole process of unnecessary medical exams and just long time spent waiting for a policy. And since 2014, they've helped over 30 million people shop for insurance and placed over $120 billion in coverage. So head to policygenius.com, get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. All right, back to the show. I think it's important for you to remember that your own experience, your own subjective internal feelings matter a whole lot. And that's something that's often ignored. Uh, you know, it's not just how much it's impacting your life, but also how much it sucks for you. You know, if you're really not feeling good, that matters. I think a lot of people don't seek help. They do not seek help because they feel like they're not bad enough or they don't have, um, this is an interesting one, but a lot of people don't feel like they have the perfect narrative to describe how they're feeling or why they're feeling the way that they do, right? They, they think about getting help, but as you said, it's like, how do I explain this? How do I, um, why am I feeling this way? I don't know why I'm feeling this way. Um, but you don't need to, right? Uh, you also don't need to be suffering worse than anyone else to seek help. You don't need to be suffering worse than other people or at a certain threshold for being bad enough. In fact, a lot of times it's better to seek help before you're in a really bad place because nobody wants you to have to hit crisis or rock bottom to start feeling better. And you do not need to understand fully what's going on with you. That's one of the points of getting professional help. They can help you sort through that. You know what you feel. You know, you feel lousy enough to be concerned. You're uncomfortable enough to write into this podcast and to consider getting professional help. Um, so that's what you start with. You know, you know how you're feeling. They can help you figure out maybe the parts of why and what you can do about it. Um, in terms of what you can say, I think you've already done a pretty darn good job um, in this question, the way that you wrote it into me. You don't need to know the conclusion. You don't need to know what's going to be happening at the end of this story. You just need to tell them where you're at right now, what you're experiencing. So in terms of exactly where to go, I would encourage you maybe to start with your primary care doctor. And as always, um, I, I think you're going to want to try to rule out some of the simplest possibilities first, you know, kind of the Occam's razor principle. And in this case, the simplest possibilities are that um, there's something fully understandable and also very identifiable that you're responding to, right? So there's something going on that's causing you to feel this way, just simple cause and effect. Um, the other simpler possibility would be that there's something physiological going on that's making you feel the way that you are. So for example, if this is just hypothetical, but if somebody was say living in an abusive household, anxiety would be totally called for 
uh, to keep them safe, to keep them aware of their surroundings, to keep them on edge and ready to take action when they need to. And that would be one of those kind of fully understandable, identifiable causes that, you know, you could definitely find some ways to work with it and develop some coping strategies. But in a way, the environment is the driver of that. And the environment is possibly what needs to change or, you know, the relationship to the environment, et cetera. And then there are some physical issues, you know, so things like low testosterone in your case or thyroid issues, anemia, meaning low iron, um, autoimmune disorders that, that, that have gone undiagnosed. There's a lot of different things that can make you feel symptoms that are very similar or overlap with those that are caused by psychiatric conditions. And there's kind of a chicken in the egg sometimes, you know, when you have autoimmune disorders, a lot of times depression is a symptom of those. Um, it's also depressing to have an autoimmune disorder and you have, you know, less energy and feel more lethargic. And so it kind of goes in a cycle. But these are things that you might be able to pick up on or rule out with the medical side of things. So, you know, you make an appointment with your primary care doctor. I don't know exactly how you're going to do that if you do that online or, you know, you call. But let's just say you call and they say, okay, um, what did you need to make an appointment for? And you could simply say that you've been having trouble emotionally, you haven't been feeling good, you've been feeling sad, uh, you're not sleeping well, and that you're just generally having a hard time and you want to try to get some help because you're not sure if it's more of a physical or a psychological issue. That would be plenty. You know, they may even cut you off before you get that far and say, okay, okay, yeah, so you're just having some mood problems, you want to see what's going on? You'd be like, yes. <laughs> you know, and then they'd set you up for an appointment. Um, and then when you get in with the doctor, same sort of thing, they'll ask you, okay, so what's going on? And you basically explain it the way that you did for me here and you know, tell them you're having a hard time. I'm not sleeping well. I feel down. I feel sad. I feel lonely, even though I'm around people that care about me. And I just, I feel like I shouldn't feel this way given everything going on in my life, but here I am. And I don't know what's going on there. I want to try to figure it out. And that's basically all you need to get started. It's going to be a conversation, right? You don't need to lay it all out from them, you know, step by step and have the entire intro, middle part and conclusion set up. This is just a start and you're going to talk about it. And from there, they'll ask you some questions. Hopefully they'll take over and kind of ask you some clarifying questions. They'll ask, is there anything in your life that might be causing this issue? You know, anything going on as we sort of talked about that could be uh, pushing you to feel this way. They might ask if you have a family history of mental health issues or if you have ever had psychiatric issues before. If they don't really ask about physical things, you could always speak up about it. I know this is somewhat hard, especially depending on kind of your individual demographics, the type of provider you have and such. But um, if you if you are able to speak up and, and actually question and say, hey, um, are there some other things that we could look into here? You know, you might just say, I've heard that sometimes, you know, hormone issues or vitamin issues can cause emotional difficulties. Do you think maybe that's something we should look into? Should we do some lab work or something like that? You know, that won't be offensive to them. And that'll let you see if they're, if they're you know, um, open to that. Um, if you feel like you're not being taken seriously, you're totally well within your rights to go find another provider. But um, don't be afraid to advocate for yourself in that way. I, you know, I should also jump in here to say that um, substances are also something to consider. You know, if you're drinking alcohol or smoking weed or using any other substances, these can definitely impact your mood, uh, your energy levels and things like that. So with your doctor, please be honest about these things. They're not going to, you know, um, get you in trouble. They're not a cop or some judgmental parent. Um, you know, they might encourage you to consider behaving differently, but they're not going to, you know, reprimand you for it, or they shouldn't at least. Um, but they do need as much information as possible so they can help you out best. And I've talked, you know, in, in recent podcasts um, about, you know, weed and, and substances and how, a lot of people will use them and convince themselves that they're serving one purpose when in reality they're serving another purpose. So they're just things to be careful of and consider in the whole picture along with all this other stuff, if relevant. Um, and then aside from talking to your doctor about these things and getting the process started that way, um, separately or in tandem, you could always reach out to a therapist to talk to. So that could be a um, somebody who does therapy at the master's level, like a marriage and family therapist or a clinical social worker. Um, somebody who's licensed to do therapy, or it could be, you know, at the doctoral level, a psychologist with a PhD or a PsyD who's licensed to do therapy. No real reason to to pick one or the other. I would say, you know, whoever it seems like would be a good fit for you is more important. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a number of options here as well. You could talk to somebody in person in their office. You could work with somebody remotely over a program like Zoom, which is, you know, what I do. I do exclusively online therapy with people, you know, all over the state. 
or even sign up for something like BetterHelp or Talkspace or something that um, can start you off quickly and give you kind of some basic help, um, you know, almost immediately. Really for you, any starting place would be good. Uh, I think you just need to kind of start the process, get that ball rolling, and then you can make adjustments and continue clarifying and stuff like that as you go along. I think that you probably just need some external help to reflect on your situation and to identify those areas where you might actually be able to make some adjustments or cope in a more effective way. Um, it sounds like you're just now kind of starting to think about ways to approach these issues and work on them. And I actually think that's great because you're very young. You're 18. You know, you're barely an adult officially. <laughs> and that means that there are many stones here that are left unturned still that you have the opportunity to go and check out. So there's many potential avenues for you getting some relief. Um, a lot of hope for your situation. As I said, I'm very proud of you for recognizing your needs, and hopefully this gives you an idea of where to begin. So good luck to you. All right, so on to question two. It reads, hello, I'm going to try and keep my situation short and concise as it has been going on for two years. When the pandemic started, I began isolating myself severely and never really broke out of it. This isolation led to more problems like a short temper, worsening anxiety, and trouble communicating properly when in conflict. My girlfriend and I recently broke up for the second time, and I never had it in me to really tell her what was going on with me. It caused major issues in our communication, and this made her believe I was just not compatible for her. She has her own anxieties, which made things more difficult. I guess I'm reaching out to know what I can do in the future when I need to express the way I'm feeling and express that it is not who I am. Thank you. Um, so thank you for the question. Again, just like the previous question, I want to give props to you for being a man and caring to actually take accountability for your mental health. We need more emotionally literate men out there. <laughs> just saying. So good job. And as I said, proud of you for this. Um, I am sorry to hear about your situation. It sounds like you've been having a pretty rough go of it the past couple of years here. And I think that throughout the course of the pandemic, a lot of things have um been more difficult. You know, a lot of people have seen things in their life become more difficult or even fall apart, whether it's relationships, jobs, family situations, what have you. You're definitely not alone in that. Um, and I know that doesn't make it easier, but it's out there. And one of the other things about this period of time is that it's kind of served for a lot of people as a magnifying glass for issues that have already existed. It sounds like you're saying that you recognize you have some trouble expressing your feelings in general and that the circumstances of the pandemic um, have basically exposed this more and made it progress to the point that it's caused a rupture in your relationship. I know it's not all on you. You said that, you know, she has her own issues and stuff like that, but um, you're trying to take ownership for your part, which is what you can do. And it sounds like the pandemic and, you know, the situation surrounding the past couple of years have really magnified that. I think there are a lot of situations, and I've seen a lot of them, where issues are exposed or accelerated due to the changing circumstances of the world. And it's tough to live with, but sometimes there is actually a little bit of a blessing in disguise because it gives you a more clear area to focus on and a more clear area for you to look at improving. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about some tips for communication, some tips about emotional awareness in general and, and kind of what we can do here. One thing to consider is that uh, when you're coming from a baseline like yours, where, you know, the feelings that are driving you to behave in a certain way may not always be apparent to you, um, it means that as you work on this, you might need to start addressing things first after they've happened. Hopefully that's not confusing phrasing. Uh, to begin with, you might need to address things after they have already happened rather than, you know, while it's happening in the moment because you your awareness of it isn't the strongest right now, so you might not be able to catch it like that. You will, but first you need to start with things that have already happened. So let's say you have a fight because you got irritated and snappy about something that was really not worth picking a fight over. You might need to take some time after the fact to ask yourself why you reacted that way. Why did I act that way? Why did I get so irritated in that moment? And there are some basic cognitive behavioral principles that would come in handy here. Um, I've talked about them frequently on the show. I also cover them extensively in my online course. If you go to my website and check out the resources, there's stuff there. Um, I have an episode on common thinking traps. I always forget what episode it is. Hold on. Let me see. Da, 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 da devthesec.com, using the search bar, common thinking traps. Uh, episode 211. So if you go to devthesec.com slash episode 211, 
that'll get you to the 10 common thinking traps episode. I also have a, a free handout on my website, um, a printable that you can print out. Um, but that's a good one to have on hand. Um, and also the emotions wheel. If you just go to Google and you search for emotions wheel, there's a graphic that helps you out to look at, um, you know, basic emotions. And then as you go further out in the wheel to the edge, it gets to be more complicated. So let's pull that up as well. Emotions wheel. I'm doing lots of typing in this episode. I know you guys don't mind that. So emotions wheel pulling that up. Um, so let's say that you're feeling something, um, let, let's just, let's do a good one, right? So you have a, one wedge of the wheel that's happy. What kind of happy? Well, there's playful, content, interested, powerful, peaceful, trusting. Um, let's say we have, we feel trusting and then you go a little bit further. What variety of trusting, maybe sensitive, maybe intimate, right? So you can get more and more granular in terms of, uh, the types of emotions that you're feeling. And it's not like a perfect guide. This just gives you a starting point because sometimes it's really hard to understand. You know, you're like, I feel bad. Okay. Well, what kind of bad? Uh, maybe I feel angry. What kind of angry? Mm, am I more bitter? Am I more like humiliated? Am I feeling disrespected? Am I feeling hostile? You know, there's different types. And so this will help you to sort of build that emotional vocabulary. So having both of those, you know, the common thinking traps, um, also called cognitive distortions in, in other places, and the emotions wheel, those are good tools for you to have in your back pocket. And then from there, you can um, do something like a thought log to look at the situation that occurred, identify how it made you feel, and then dig into your own thoughts to see what belief or interpretation you had that drove you to feel that way. Um, so let's take like an arbitrary example. I don't know if this is anything like what you experienced, but let's say that you snapped at your girlfriend for leaving clutter on the kitchen counter, you know, just something small, but it led to a conflict because you got annoyed at her. And then she got upset at you for being mad and being angry or mean. And it spiraled from there and it turned into a whole conflict, right? So what you do is you start with what happened, which we just described, right? Your girlfriend left clutter on the kitchen counter and you snapped at her for it. Then you think of how that made you feel. So that's where you can use the emotions wheel, you know, you work your way out and, you know, rather than just stopping with, I was mad, you might discover, oh, I was pretty irritated and a little resentful and I felt kind of disrespected, right? So you can get more specific with the emotion. And then the question is why, why did you feel so irritated by that? Um, and this is where both the thinking traps and just considering the context of the situation come into play because maybe there was something else that you were stressed out about on that day and you simply projected that onto her. That happens to all of us sometimes. Or maybe you were overgeneralizing a bit and assuming that this means she doesn't care about the space that you guys were stuck in together. Like if she doesn't care for the counter, she must not care for the entire space. She may not care about living with you or whatever. Um, maybe there's personalization going on, like, oh, she left this stuff out just to annoy me or you know, there's something that um, has to do with me that caused her to behave in this way. There's tons of different possibilities, right? Any number of explanations. And it may take a few tries for you to sort of try it on for size and see what fits. Do I feel that way? Is that what I was thinking in that situation? You know, you try it out and see what clicks in. The point I'm trying to make here is that after you discover um, the answer or some possible answers, you can follow up, right? So you did your work, you figured out why things ended up the way they did for you, why you got that emotional reaction. And then you would follow up with your girlfriend. And I know you're not together anymore, but I'm just saying at the time, you know, your girlfriend, this is possibly how it could have been handled. Um, talk about it. A lot of people don't want to bring up old conflicts or issues because it feels like you're rocking the boat for no reason. And it's like, oh, I'd, why would I want to bring up conflict when we're doing okay? But I do encourage you to do it. It doesn't have to be a big conflict. Um, it's possible now that there's been some distance from the event that you're both in a more stable place, a better emotional state. And you can both interpret the situation and discuss it in a more productive way, right? Rather than when you're heated. So it doesn't have to be like a, a big thing. You could say, hey, um, remember the other day when uh, we fought about the clutter on the counter? Yeah. So first off, I'm sorry about that. And I do encourage you to apologize if there's, if there's something that you feel bad for. It's not, um, it's not a bad thing to apologize there. So you can say, look, I'm sorry about that. I know that I put you on guard by just jumping down your throat about it. Um, I realized... I was having a bad day and I didn't even think about it at that point. But, you know, since then I've realized I was having a bad day in general and I didn't share that with you and you got way more heat than you deserved about it. So I'm going to try to slow down more and communicate better in the future, how I'm feeling. So we don't run into that. 
um, that'd be a great way to bring it up. You know, it, it would, it would probably make her feel, you know, understood, heard, and, you know, confident that you're going to try to do it a little bit differently in the future. Um, now that might be hard to do if you're just not good at communicating with each other. So it might be helpful to work on communication within relationships in general, uh, in specific, you know, making sure you don't get out of the habit of talking about things other than just, you know, small talk. So make sure you do talk about things that are of more substance. And this could be something as rigid as a weekly check-in. I know some people that really benefit from, you know, at the end of each week or sometime during the middle of the week, having like a set aside check-in time with each other. Or it could just be prioritizing more time together, you know, making sure to eat meals at the same time while sitting at the table or having, you know, more times to go out and do things together, uh, prioritizing that kind of quality time so that conversation topics can come up. Um, I think it's important for you to understand that you are allowed to feel anything you feel. In fact, you really don't have a whole lot of control over what you feel, at least initially, and uh, neither did she in these cases. And I would encourage you to work on being more honest about what you're feeling. I think that you can lead with the feeling, say, this is what's going on for me, I'm feeling this way, and then be curious about it and maybe leave some space to figure it out. And you may be surprised how much that helps, leading with the feeling and then trying to be collaborative. Um, so like in that example from above, if you were sort of in the situation where the clutter was there, you were getting irritated, you might be like, okay, let me pause. For some reason, this is really getting my goat. <laughs> this is really irritating me for some reason. Um feels like more than it should. Am I off base here? Should I be this upset? You know, and just sort of like throw that out there and that invites her to be collaborative, her or anybody that you're that you're talking with. Um, and from there, maybe she would have said, no, you know what, you're totally right. I've been neglecting these things. I'm sorry, that's, that's a burden on you that you don't need to have. Or she might say, yeah, babe, I think that's quite a bit for this little thing. I, you know, I didn't want you to be jumping down my throat about this. Um, is there anything else going on that I should know about? Um, you know, she may even have her own stuff to take accountability for, like whatever, it could go any number of directions, but sort of leading with the feeling and then inviting that collaboration and talking with it uh, or about it could be a very helpful strategy. There are tons of resources out there, books, courses, videos, things to help with communication. Um, I did a whole episode on communication tips and active listening, which I would highly suggest you check out. Uh, DuffThePsych.com slash episode 217 is where you can find that. Again, talking just about, you know, communication in general, talking about active listening, how to make sure somebody knows you're hearing them, all of that stuff. Um, and aside from communication, I think that your job also will be to continue working on building your own emotional literacy. This is by engaging in self-reflection, you know, looking at situations in your life and asking yourself what the emotional drivers behind those situations seem to be. You could also ask for feedback from other people in your life. Um, so people that are still in your life, like trusted loved ones or family, it can also be from people like your ex who are really no longer in your life. Uh, and, and this is a scary strategy to many, but it could be super valuable. You know, you can say, listen, I know that things between us went poorly and we're done. However, I'm trying to do better, you know, for myself and for others. And I wanted to know, you know, how you felt when I did X, Y, Z, you know, or just asking for some sort of feedback. You could even say, look, I'm not going to respond. You could write it to me in an email or something like that, and I won't respond. I just really would like to do better. So if you could give me some of that feedback, I would appreciate it. She might say no, you know, and that's kind of the worst that could happen, but um, you might be surprised. She might be like, yes, I have feedback for you. And it might be a tough pill to swallow. You may not agree with all of it, but it's valuable information. And then lastly, you know, working on your own self-regulation can be a big help here. Um, I mentioned this. Uh, before, but it's it's super hard for your brain to think rationally when you're emotionally elevated. So that frontal lobe of the brain I was talking about earlier, that part of the brain gets overwhelmed when the kind of more primitive anxiety driven part of your brain is screaming. So, you know, that's just simple neurology, the reason that that happens. And so that logical part of your brain getting overloaded makes it harder for you to engage in productive discussions and really kind of fully thinking through things. And therefore, uh, looking at the signs and, and recognizing what your personal signs of elevation are, you know, to see when you're kind of building up to that. And also, um, you know, having some tools that you can apply to your situation when you do find yourself getting elevated, that could be very, very helpful. So deep breathing, giving yourself some physical space, going and getting some fresh air, um, asking to postpone a conversation until you've had some time to think about it. These are all ways of giving yourself some time, some space 
and giving your brain the conditions that it needs to be able to think more rationally. So um, hopefully these are giving you kind of some ideas to work on. Um, you know, I think that becoming more emotionally aware in general is going to be a big help for you between building that emotional literacy, learning what your patterns are, your common signs of being elevated, you know, working on communication a little bit, and then also just your own um, coping strategies for when you do feel the kind of fire rising up in you. All of that can make a huge difference in relationships in the future and also just your relationship with yourself. So thank you for confronting this. Thank you for asking the good question. And uh, that's it for this episode, guys. This has been episode 300 of the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast. I already gave you all of my things at the beginning, but please do know that I appreciate you and your attention. If you want the show notes, go to deftthesych.com slash episode 300. Um, if you want to send in a question, send it to deftthesych at gmail.com. And I'll see you for the next one when we get into episode 301. Have a good week, guys. Bye.